Hello, everyone. Um, this is Dr. Rangs with Kanchanavanit. I'm giving this talk on the point of care cardiac ultrasounds. This should be a video for you to um, review before taking the course of um, point of care ultrasound. We all know that uh, these days we had varied various um, type of ultrasound machine. Uh, many of them are materialized now as a handheld machine and they've been widely used and it um, become very useful, especially in an emergent situation where we need to decide, um, you know, making um, the correct diagnosis and make the right um, treatment. It's now um, considered the ultrasound as an extended physical examination where you um, used to teach, taught in school that you have, um, whether you're um, looking at the patient, palpating, um, you know, um, percussion and auscultation, but now ultrasoundization, another um, uh, skill that most of the doctors now need to be equipped with. So um, it's the right test at the right time um, that will change a lot of um, um, treatment um, decision. Although we had other um, sophisticated fancy machines that um, give us much more clearer image, but um, the problem is that those machines are not portable. So um, I think ultrasound will be here for, for many years to come. Um, this is um, a kind of ultrasound machine that can be connected to um, uh, the phone, uh, mobile phone, um, but um, it's only work with the Android system though, this one, but it's becoming very um, popular now. So the, which are the, these are the clinical scenario where POCUS is, um, is used. Um, either patients coming with chest uh, or cardiac trauma, either blunt chest or penetrating injury, especially in the patients with cardiac arrest or peri-arrest, you might need to distinguish the patient between um, those with um, you know, uh, the 5H and 5T etiology of the um, cardiac arrest and distinguish those of a pseudo um, um, PEA or, you know, uh, or from the true PEA, which I'll, I'll elab elaborate more later on, especially in patients with shock and hemorrhagic unstable. This is very important. Um, as a sound will come, become very useful. Patients will present with dyspnea, chest pain, and syncope when cardiac structures is uh, suspected. Briefly, I'm going to review briefly about the um, plane or view of ultrasounds uh, of the heart. Heart is a middle um, chest structure, but the apex usually point, most of them, of course, point to the left. Um, there is a axis that we're going to use to create image um, as follow. The long axis is the plane that cuts through the heart from the base of the heart to the apex. And the short axis is the one perpendicular to that of the, the heart, uh, of, of the long axis. Whereas the four chamber view will be the one that will cut through all four chambers of heart at the same time. These are the windows. Windows, are the, the usual one that we use um, very commonly are these four windows. Um, the most commonly used are the parastonal window, especially the left parastonal window, the apical window, the subsiphoid window, which can be extended in the fast examination, and the suprasternal window. Uh, but sometimes you may have additional windows, such as the right parastonal and right apical, especially in cases with um, um, atic stenosis or those with dextrocardia. Combination with window and plane, you get view of echo view. Um, in parastonal view, you got various view, um, like parastonal long, short, are we in flow, out flow, right parastonal view. Apical four, apical two chamber, apical long axis, subsiphoid, we, we can have subsiphoid four chamber wheel, subsiphoid short axis wheel, and a suprasternal wheel. But I think we're gonna um, concentrate or focus on just these wheel to begin with. In, in the workshop, you will be um, trained to do all this wheel um, as, as a core um, 
skill, the parasonal long axis, the parasonal short axis, the apical four channel wheel, the subcostal four channel wheel, and the suprasternal wheel. So we start with the parasternal wheel. This is the um, plane that cut through from the base of the heart to the apex. Usually the position of the probe will be at about um, third or fourth intercostal space. The marker would be pointing to the right shoulder, cutting the heart um, at long axis. You will identify the, um, uh, the, the structure. You, you will have the atic valve and mitral valve at the, um, uh, in the middle of, of, of those, um, those both two valve. The ventricle is the left ventricle wall should be parallel to each other. The introceptum and the posterior wall should be parallel to each other. That um, will um, signify the parasonal sternal wheel. It's uh, analogy to the cutting of a cucumber, cutting in a long axis like that. And you have to make sure that you're cutting it um, in, the, in the middle of the cucumber not just the side of it. So you make sure you had the atic valve and mitral valve in the, in the middle of those valve, you have both walls per, um, per row as much as you can. Okay, and that will, and you will have the LV uh, diameter as, as big as possible because with um, non um, coaxial or non long, true long axis, you will get a, a much um, narrower, um, diameter of the LV. So make sure you got this right, okay? The structure you, you'll see, of course, these are the left atrium, the left ventricle and aorta, and that's a right ventricle outflow track, part of the right ventricle. The mitral valve, you'll see the anterior mitral leaflet and posterior uh, leaflets, atic valve. See the atic valve is opening during the systole, the mitral valve opens during diastole, with the relaxation, you got um, mitral valve open, and with atrial contraction, you have another op opening of mitral valve. You can see that there is a, um, you know, a mitral valve dancing, or there's two opening face of the mitral valve, the rapid filling and the atrial contraction there. The coaptation of the valve should be around one centimeter. Um, that will um, make sure that the valve is competent. And the um, the AD valve you see uh, you see that the, um, comprise of the um, right coricast at the anterior as aspect, and the and the posterior one would be either left cast or non coricast depends on a little bit, a bit of um, the plane you cut. Usually the left atrium is around three centimeter, more or less the same size of as the ascending aorta, LV. Usually in diastole would be about around, roughly about four, 4.5 centimeter. The structure you see here, the circular structure you see here is the descending aorta. And perhaps not very well demonstrated here in the AV group, you can see another, um, you know, another circle, small circle there in the AV group. This, if you look at the anatomy up there, this is the curry sinus. So be familiar with this, and then when we encounter abnormal finding, you will uh, you will um, notice that something is not quite right. For instance, if you have a, a large left atrium, there's possibilities, um, a tree possibility. One of them is, of course, any uh, mitral valvular uh, disease like mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation. Another would be a patient with uh, prolonged or long-standing uh, chronic atrial fibrillation that have atrial remodeling. The third would be the one who had a long-standing of high filling pressure, high LV endastic pressure. So we can use left atrial size as a marker of a diastolic dysfunction, which happens chronically. Left ventricle usually large if there's a volume overload or the myocardial disease of the LV. It could be small in the patient with underfilled, um, you know, hypovolemia or you know, obstructive shock that you know they have less venous return coming back to the left heart. 
you can look at the LV contraction um, there and you can, these are the antroseptums, these are the posterior wall. Now coming to the short axis, the short axis can be various short axis. You can cut the heart in the, in the, um, the base of the ventricle or the mid ventricle or the apex, or even you can move it up to um, cut the plane at the aortic valve or even a bit higher at the great arteries like the um, also the pulmonic valve. So it it's depends on the planes you cut and produce different image. But I think for, for this particular workshop, we will stress on, um, you know, uh, generate the most um, useful uh, plane, which is the mid ventricle, ventricular plane. You will, you will cut the LV in the middle and you will notice that there are papillary muscles, uh, the post uh, anterolateral and the posterior medial papillary muscle. That will denote that you are cutting at the middle of the mid ventricles plane. In this particular um, uh, video, you can see this is a short axis, which are uh, not quite in the middle. You can see the mitral valve there, so it's more or less of the base of the, of the ventricle. Uh, the vent LV, um, are usually round in the normal setting. The septums have to bulge from the left to the right because the pressure on the left side is much higher uh, than that on the right side. The right ventricle had a complex geometry, but looking at, at the short axis view like this, it will resemble those like a, you know, a, a crescent or a croissant, if you like, shape, where LV is a donut and RV is a croissant. This is a normal user sh shape, which you had a pressure higher on the left side. Okay. The, the mid uh, LV, you, you'll be identified by the, as I uh, mentioned, the L, um, the both papillary muscle, the anterolaterals and the posterior medial. If you cut much higher, you will cut at the aortic level. You can see all the three cusp producing a, like a Mercedes Benz like image where you identify the right cusp, left cusp, and non correct cusp. The left atrium will be identified along with the left atrial appendage, which may have um, an image, uh, the morphology look like those of a, a horn of a cow or a buffalo. Okay. The other uh, one the, um, caveats that uh, you need to be careful is that by cutting the, you know, the plane of the short axis, the real, um, real true, I mean, true short axis need to be parallel to each other. Otherwise, if you tilt the probe, probe or angulate the probe only, you, you might cutting um, the plane at posteriorly at a different level, but and anteriorly you more or less will be at the same area. So you might create an oblique cut. But having said that, it is not easy to um, make the plane parallel for every every um, level because there's a um, intercostal, um, there, there's a rib in, in, in between and you might need to combine a little bit of angulation manipulation with the probe also, but keep that to the minimum if you can. For the apical view, um, there is several views or apical view, but I'll, I'll walk you through, but the most important view we um, use will be the apical Four chamber view, where we, we identified we can cut the plane where you get all the four chambers in one pictures. There's an LV um, on usually we put it on the right side of the screen and the RV on the left side of the screen. This is called the ASE format, American Society Echo format. Um, there are there are people who might want to um, orientate the pictures differently. Those, especially those from Mayo Clinic, they will, they will, they have their own formats called the Mayo format, where they put the LV on the left side of the screen. Okay, um, these are we we identify the fortune review by looking at the mitral valve. You have to see both mitral valve and tricuspid valve in the middle of the both valve, and you the left ventricle uh, and the right ventricle should be as long as possible. Means that you must not fall short in the, the plane. If you put the apex at the very, at the true apex, you will see the longest 
ventricle as possible. You can notice that um, you can see the relative size of both ventricles. The right ventricle, of course, is smaller than the left ventricle. It can be um, as, as big as, as two thirds as mi at maximum. We can allow it to be, you know, uh, usually it's about half, but, you know, we allow if it's about two thirds the size of left ventricle is still considered normal. Anything above that, there is a uh, right ventricle enlargement. If RV is the same size of the LV, that's obviously an enlarged RV already. We identified, actually, we can identify the ventricles by looking at the insertion of the atrial ventricular valve, which one is more apical. In this particular patient, um, you can see that on this right side, you can see that the insertion is more apical than on, on this side. So uh, being um, the, if you can identify that atrial ventricular valve being more apical insertion, it's obviously a tricuspid valve. That, so the uh, corros correspondent ventricle would be the right ventricle. This is maybe important in patients with complex congenital where you might have a uh, discordance of connection between the atrium and the ventricles. These are the formats that I mentioned before. Um, usually the American Society Echo, um, Society Echo will have the LV on the right side of the screen like that. The Mayo formats will, will be differently, um, opposite. The pediatrics, um, um, pediatricians will have the image flipped up so that it will be more anatomical, um, you know, like the, in the real patients where left ventricle is below and the atrium is above. There are other view of apical wheels like this one is apical two chamber wheel, where you have to rotate the probe about 60 degree um, counterclockwise from the four chamber wheel. So you cut through the um, LV and LA and there's without demonstrating any part of the right side of, of the heart. Sometimes you will get the descending aorta as a very long axis of the tube of descending aorta there, of thoracic descending aorta. The wall you'll see in left ventricle there will be anterior wall and the inferior wall. So that's the apical two chamber wheel. There is actually more uh, apical chamber view than just four and two chamber view. If you um, turn it, um, rotates even more, like 120 degree from four chamber view, you will get a apical long axis view or apical long axis or, or apical three chamber. This is um, very similar to the parasitic long axis view, but you can see that the apex is visible and it's you know pointing up to the to the probe whereas in personal long axis wheel the apex are not demonstrated and you have a more horizontal like um, heart it can be used instead of a personal long axis but um, the downside of it is that the some of the structure like atrial valve and mitral valve is much further from the probe so that the detail of the image might not be as as clear or as, as good as the parasternal um, view for those you know, far few structure. From the four chamber view, if you um, angulate the, the uh, probe anteriorly, you will enter and you will encounter the aortic valve there or aorta there. That is useful for assessment of aortic valve, especially in if you want to study Doppler um, study of the aortic valve like AS, aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation or calculate or measure the stroke volume, this will be um, um, a view to obtain. If you angulate the probe posteriorly, you will encounter a tubular structures that draining to the right atrium. That is a Cori sinus. That is so-called Cori sinus view. There is actually another view that um, between the four chamber wheel and the apical two chamber wheel. When you rotate, not quite 60 degree, you might find that uh, the mitral valve had three parts, two and in the um, 
two in the sides and one in the middle. And we call that a bicommissural view. Okay, that's another view that, you know, we don't use it very often, but it's an it's additional one. Yeah, this is the um, four-chamber view, about 45 degree, or, or you will get a bicommissural view. 60 degree, you have a two-chamber view. 120, you have a apical three-chamber view or apical long axis. Five-chamber view, apical long axis. You might uh, heard people saying, um, you know, they, um, you know, they prefer in certain condition to do a LV focus or RV focus view. Um, this is just the, um, you know, a variation of apical four chamber view, but, but in in um, some patient where the ventricles are enlarged and, you know, the apical four chamber view might be, the sectors might be too small to include both of ventricles. So it depends on what structure you are look you try to concentrate on. If you want to see the LV properly, you might have to, you know, you might have to um, tilt your probe a bit to have all the LV in the middle, okay? Or you might want the RV to be in the middle. So it depends on on um, you know which one you are focusing at. Another one is subcostal view, and um, this. Um, can be very useful in, in some patients where they had um, like emphysematous lung, where you know all the if you all the parasternal image are you know are not optimal at all. Um, they might have a scaphoid abdomen, which is can be easy uh, for the subcostal view, and especially during um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. You wouldn't want to be interfering with the chest compression. But you might want to, you know, uh, get gain some information during that time. You might do a subcostal view um, during, um, you know, chest compression also. <clears throat> it's it's very similar to the full chamber view. It's just that the probe is not pointing from the apex. It's more like from the, um, you know, from the side of the RV, from the inferior side of the RV, and that, you know, this is similar plane to that of apical full chamber view. This is the subcostal view. So structures are more or less similar the same. Sometimes you get the liver there too, okay. And this particular image is not a normal heart. You can see that the left atrium is enlarged. This particular image um, is very good if you want to see um, some of the structure in the heart such as intraatrial septums, because um, you know the ultrasound will produce the best image if that structure is perpendicular to the ultrasound beam. If in four chamber wheel, you might get a drop out, drop out of the echo image in the interatrial septum, and you might uh, falsely um, identify atrial septal defect because the fossa overlays of the, the thin part of the um, Interior septum might appear like you know a hole, whereas they actually not there's no um, no hole at all. You have to be at um, we confirm that by doing the costal view where you have the interior septum perpendicular to the ultrasound view. Also, if this is standard view where you can measure the thickness of the RV free wall because. Again, the RV free wall is now perpendicular to the ultrasound beam. So you had a, um, you know, a proper, you know, the spatial resolution vertically will be, will be very good. The subcostal view that is very useful that we um, you know, will usually, um, you know, get a lot of information out of, of is the, um, the aorta and the IVC. Because the IVC is more to the right of the decimating aorta, it's, it's also the same vertical view, but it depends on where you put the probe on. And you, uh, you can identify that the decimating aorta, abdominal aorta, you see that it's pulsatile um, according to the cardiac cycle. Whereas the IVC, you can see the hepatic vein, the liver, the hepatic vein, and you can see the connection to that of the right atrium. The fluctuation that will, that if any, you can see that will be fluctuate along with the respiration cycle, not the cardiac cycle, unless certain cardiac condition like 
tricuspid regurgitation where you can have a pulsatile IVC accordingly to the, to the cardiac cycle. So this is a subcostal IVC view where you can assess the IVC. That's a subcostal abdominal aorta. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll probably not go into much of the detail, but these are the extra view that um, we might um, want, um, want to try. These are called the parasonal RB inflow view. Is um, they are you cutting a same plane? And you 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 start with the parasonal long axis, and then you angulate the the plane uh, more medially, and you will get this plane of the RA and RV. This is called the RV inflow view. It's useful to assess of RV pathology, RV size, IVC, query sinus will be identified. Lastly, would be the suprasternal view. This is not an easy view in the adult, um, but it's very useful for you know, aortic pathology. You can identify the aortic arch, the, um, the destiny aorta. So if patients have aortic aneurysm, coarctation, dissection, this will be a view uh, that we try to obtain. So that's a brief um, summary of the view, which obviously we, can, we need to uh, go through that again and practice and then, you know, familiarize ourselves with all the normal structures before we encounter the true pathology. But now I want to um, move on to another talks about how to use a POCUS in shock and heart failure. Note that I put two C there, POCUS. I want to stress that this is not a point of care ultrasounds only, it's a point of care cardiac ultrasound. So we're gonna um, focus only on the um, cardiac ultrasounds. In critically ill patient, these are um, you know, settings where we can use echo or cardiac ultrasounds to help us. In patient with hypotension, and especially we want to um, gain the information whether this patient will respond to fluid therapy or not. Um, the other thing is patient with unexplained hypoxia, okay? Th those are valvular emergency, those with acute Cori syndromes, acute aortic syndrome, acute pulmonary embolism, stroke or systemic embolization, during or after resuscitation. We're not going to go through everything, of the, uh, every um, aspect of these because some of them would be um, very, um, you know, you need a high um, skill of echo or, or, or prolonged uh, training for some of those and may need to understand Dopplers and uh, other uh, aspects of ultrasounds. What we, we will focus on things that, um, you know, more common and um, things that, you know, general practitioners or internists or emergency physicians, non cardiologists who you like, uh, can be able, you know, uh, I would be comfortable of using it to identify it. Okay, we start with patient who come in with shortness of breath or dyspnea. Heart failure, the patients are, they present very similarly symptoms, dyspnea or top near. Okay, they are swelling of the legs and, you know, you similar examination, you get jugular vein in, in uh, engorgement, you get crepitations or rales in the lungs. There's symptom, similar symptoms and signs, but actually the underlying pathology is, is very different. So you must not only diagnose heart failures, that's not enough. You need to be able to tell what's the etiology of Heart, that heart failure because the treatment will, be, will differ a lot. By giving only diuretics, patient will get better, most of, most of them, but you don't, that you don't change at all. You don't change the pathology of the heart at all. So you need to know the etiology. First of all, you might use your ultrasounds to, um, to see, uh, look at the lungs, whether it's congested or not by looking at the B lines which is uh, the uh, more, uh, it's the lines that, you know, a comet tail or vertical uh, lines like that, artifacts that um, suggest there are interloper um, edema fluid in that. So we can use this to identify the, um, suggest as that we are dealing with coronary congestion, if it's bilaterally and, you know, 
um, typical finding like that. Now, we, we can use the ultrasound, of course, to assess the ventricular function. And um, I'll give another talk on the how to exactly measure uh, systolic function of ejection fraction. But uh, for the sake of this lecture, I will only focus on the visual estimation, the eyeball assessment. So if we look at these three images, you can see that number one, everyone of course will agree that this left ventricle is contracting vigorously, very, very good systolic function. In fact, it is hyperdynamic. And also if you look at it, um, the mitral valve, you can see that one of the mitral valve, the posterior leaflet is, is flailed. Okay, so this patient had a mitral regurgitation and they had a supernormal ejection fraction. So anyway, you look at that ventricle, I think all of us will agree that this ventricle is contracting very well. Whereas number three, I think there will be very little disagreement or no disagreement at all that this left ventricle is, is very, very bad. It's not hardly contracting at all. And you can see at the apex, there is a, a mass there, which the, the, um, the echogenicity suggests that is, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a thrombus. You have low flow and poor contractile contracting ventricles, uh, there's an apical thrombus there. But with number two, that is a tricky one. You probably, I think uh, every, not everyone would agree, this is a good ventricle, is it a bad ventricle, is it mildly depressed, or is it, you know, what ejection fraction that will be? And that number two, you might need a proper quantification or measurements to come out with a prop, uh, of a accurate figures. Okay, number one is a good ventricle. Number two is a so-so ventricle. Actually, is mildly reduced. The ejection fraction would be around forty-five something uh, percent. The number three is very poor ventricle. Uh, ejection fraction maybe about um, twenty. But ejection fraction are not to be worship, if you like. I uh, means that it's not everything. It's not marker of everything of the what heart is doing. You can have ejection fraction of a, a good ejection fraction, but you can still have heart failure. Of course, you all know about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. It could be valvular heart disease. It could be um, pericardial disease. It can be so, all sorts of things. So it doesn't mean that you know all the information you, you want is ejection fraction. You have to interpret it with them. Um, um, good um, you know, clinical knowledge. So yeah, as I told you, the um, heart failure can caused by the valvular heart disease, the endocardium problem, it could be myocardium problem, it could be systolic dysfunction, it could be diastolic uh, problem, or it could be a pericardial disease. Okay, okay, but um, so we, we're gonna show various you know, pathology of uh, heart failure. This is the um, dilated left ventricle, poorly contract globally, globally hypokinesia. So this is uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, a uh, uh, heart failure reduced ejection fraction. Whereas this patient, you can see in this parastinal long axis wheel, the left ventricle is contracting very well, isn't it? It contracts so well that the walls are kissing <laughs> during systole, the cavity obliterate during systole. And you can notice, I think, although you're not, some of you may not be very familiar with echo, but I think you'd be probably um, think that the walls of the ventricles look thick, right? Because usually um, during diastole, if you measure the, the thickness of the wall, it's probably around one centimeter, but over here is almost like two centimeter already during diastole. 1.5, okay. So it is contracting well. The patient had heart failure. Why is that? It's because it does not relax well. But you wouldn't be able to tell that by just looking at it. You need a sophisticated measurement by Doppler. You have to measure the velocity of the flow of the blood and velocity of the myocardium during diastole. And you can, you can tell whether there's something wrong about the mechanics of relaxation that's happening. So this is a hypertension patient who so not well treated and um, you know, um, 
present with uh, heart failure. And the other thing in this uh, particular patient, you can see, notice that the left atrium is enlarged. There is no uh, mitral valve disease as such, um, but um, and the um, there's no atrial fib. The um, rhythm is sinus rhythm, but um, still you have a enlarged left atrium because of the long-standing elevation of LV endoscopic pressure or the filling pressure. We all know that the um, classification of heart failure, or you know, you can have a heart failure reduced, heart failure preserved ejection fraction, or heart failure mildly reduced ejection fraction by using different cut points of the ejection fraction. But you, you, these are not comprehensive. You can have valvular heart, you can have pericardium disease, which should not be included in, in these um, categories. Like this one. Okay, this is a patient with. You can see that the left atrium is enlarged. You can see the mitral valve looks strange. It wants to open, but it cannot open. It's stopped, right? It's stuck because there are commissural fusions of the mitral valve bowing or, uh, or the, the um, doming of the valve doing diastole. It cannot open well, okay? This is the um, rheumatic heart disease, mitral stenosis. The patient's left ventricle is not a problem, but although in this particular patient, you can notice that the, I think the must be some, the, the, the loop of the video is not complete, but you know, the left ventricle is not the, the main reason by patient heart failure. It's the, um, you have a obstruct mitral valve, so you have a high L pressure and you have a high wedge pressure. And so, so um, you have, you know, high, you got pre-edema by that. Oh, this, another patient had a, another, Patient with valvular heart disease, where you can notice that the atrial valve is destroyed. I feel like is becoming like you know, um, like a you know, it's ragged. It's um, you know, me, um, there's a vegetation attached to it, um, oscillating structures which are the um, you know, it might embolize, uh, systemic embolize there. Um, the valve is destroyed, so you had a torrential. Um, of aortic regurgitation, although it's not demonstrated here with the doctors, but you can see that the valve that destroyed like that, you're certainly going to have massive or torrential regurgitation. This, this is another patient who uh, present to us with heart failure and we treated with usual medication for heart failure without any improvement. Of course, he wouldn't have any improvement. If you can look at that, this, uh, this patient is not suffer from half a reduced ejection fraction, ejection fraction, but instead he having a constriction pericarditis, um, constricted pericarditis. You can see that during diastole, it bounces the ventricle, try to relax, but it cannot you know, go all the way. It stops and bounces. Okay, the ventricles look narrowed and long because the, um, the constriction uh, effects of the pericardium. Looking at neck vein, you can see that during inspiration, instead of um, collapsing of the neck vein um, um, along with the decreasing in the intrathoracic pressure, you have the opposite. You can see that during inspiration, the neck veins goes up. That's the Cushmal signs where um, you can find in these patients. And of course, the treatment would be um, surgery. In this particular patient, what is the cause of heart failure? You can see that the ventricle is dilated and poorly contracting. Okay, so the patient had heart failure, reduced ejection fraction. But at the same time, you can see the atic valve is not coapt at all. So that certainly this patient is suffering from a severe atic regurgitation also. So um, both, right? We had both valve problem and the myocardium problem. The mitral valve doesn't look to open very well, that is not because there's a commissural fusion or rheumatic process. It opens very little because there is a premature closure of the valve because the LV pressures go up very quickly. So um, instead of um, closing the mitral valve during LV contraction, it's in the end as the mitral valve already closed. This is a premature closure in mitral valve. So it's open very little and very um, brief. So this is the Doppler that shows a severe atrial regurgitation. And this is an obvious case of heart failure where you wouldn't be able to 
treat this patient right if you don't do ultrasound image, right? You will only find um, the, the answer in autopsy, if you like, if you don't do ultrasounds. This particular um, woman uh, had a mass that obstruct mitral valve during diastole. And this large mass is atriomyxoma. Okay, so obviously this patient doesn't need medication. It wouldn't help her if she needed a surgery. So it's, we need to ask these questions. We, when we uh, encounter patients who um, uh, present with heart failure or, or dyspnea, is it really, is it heart failure? Okay, what is the underlying cardiac, cardiac pathology? What is the real cause of heart failure? And once you identify that pathology, maybe you have to ask whether that pathology is, is severe enough. Is it respons really a responsible, um, a real culprit, not just a you know, bystander um, but, um, for the, the sign of symptoms of that heart failure? Okay. When you find that there is a poorly contracting ventricles or you find there's a leaky valve, you might have to ask further whether what is the cause of that pathology, okay? Is it ischemic or is it non-ischemic? Is it endocarditis, is it rheumatic or whatever, mitral valve prolapse or whatever? Do you have to answer what is the cause of that pathology? And then lastly, you might have to um, identify the precipitating cause of the um, heart failure symptoms that makes the patients come back to you, or come to you. So uh, a reminder again, heart failure should never be a final diagnosis. Okay, move on from heart failure. Um, the um, important thing is that we all know, um, we all need to know how to use ultrasounds in patients with unstable hemodynamics on shock syndrome. What are the essential information we need to acquire? We need to look at the LV, the size of it. Is it enlarged or is it too small? Both can be important. What's the contractility likes? both globally or regional part of the left ventricle. If we can, we might want to um, study the filling pattern of the left ventricle, whether it suggests suggest of an underfilled ventricle, hypovolemia, or does it suggest of a high filling pressure or volume overload. The right ventricle, look at the size, if it's small, if it's enlarged, what's the systolic function or contractility? Look in the precardio, the amount and the pressure effects, the evidence of tamponade. The valvular pathology, if we can identify it. Pulmonary hypertension, if there are any evidence of this, and other major pathological findings. Okay, start with a case. A 60 years old male um, with underlying diabetes, hypertension, and di uh, this lipidemia, present with, uh, in the emergency room with epicastric pain. He looks a bit drowsy, has cold, clammy skin, blood pressure of 90 over 70, a very, very fast heart rate, looking pale. Um, the CT shows diffuse mild STT changes. At first, the um, attending um, doctors thought that the patient might suffer from some kinds of acute core syndrome with that kind of um, you know, discomfort, but he's in, in shock. What's the, the cause of this shock or this hemolytic unstable? Looking at these three pictures of ultrasounds, cardiac ultrasounds, the first one, the parasitic long axis, okay, the short axis and the full chamber view. So what do you think? Is this patient shock from, suffer from hypovolemia or is it a acute MI, sepsis, cardiac tamponade or acute, acute pulmonary embolism? Okay, make up your mind. Look at this image. What is the cause of this shock? A pumping failure of some kind or is it hypovolemia or is it a kind of a obstructive shock of some kind? Well, I think most of us probably got it right, hopefully. You can see that the ventricles actually contracting very well. In fact, too well, if you like, because the walls are kissing each other. 
you can see that the, um, the ventricle is actually small. During diastole, you can see the diameter of the heart. If you look at these um, uh, blue dots there, that's one centimeter, you see? That's one centimeter apart. You see, during diastole, it's only about like two centimeter, okay? And systole is zero <laughs> because the wall um, kiss, okay, between them, collapse. So this means that the LV is very much underfill, okay? There's not much volume coming in. The atriums look small, okay? You see, this is a short axis where you have the kissing of the wall again. Full chamber view, you can see that both sides, the LV, LA, and the RVRA, they're all very slim, okay? They're all very small and, and thin. The cavity is narrowed. You have a hypercontractility there, try to compensate for something. So this is a patient who had a hypovolemia. Okay, so it can be confirmed by looking at the um, IVC, of course. Okay, this especially this particular patient actually had a cardiac murmur, because if you look, you put a color in, you can see that there's a um, turbulence or um, increased flow in the ventricle because of the intraventricular gradient from the hypercontractile. So the echo finding, you find that the IVC is collapsed. Okay, um, those markedly hypovolemic RV and LV. And the patient doesn't seem to have any diarrhea, doesn't seem to be any vomiting. They put an NG tube, they couldn't find any blood or the, you know, PR, they aren't any, you know, this normal stool. They don't know where the fluid went. I mean, where's the hypovolemia? Where's... So we have to look at the third space lost. So I look at the fast in the abdomen and the pleural fusion, hemothorax and things like that. Anyway, they found that there is a free fluid Okay, large, large amount of it, and it looks sort of hypo, hyper echoic. So it's not, not like you know water, <laughs> uh, you know simple um, effusion or ascites. It's more like a blood, and yet they identified that the patient had abdominal aorta. So um, this is a suspect case of a rupture and uh, abdominal aorta, a abdominal. Um, Anorism. So the patient was rushing to the OR and got correct. And that, you know, it was resuscitated with a lot of fluid and then rushed to the OR. So um, hypovolemia, if it's an extreme case, it can be identified with echo. Mind you that a CVP can be misleading sometimes because if the patient ha had hyper uh, pulmonary hypertension or tricuspid regurg, you might still have a, you know, the, the vein might not be collapsed at all. So uh, if you look at the um, heart, it would be more, more sensitive there. Um, you can use uh, the IVC uh, assessing this, the um, CVP. And um, these are the emergency physician's um, criteria where the estimate CVP or right atrial pressure will be in the um, unit of centimeter water. Whereas for the cardiologist, we use the... Um, American Society Echo, and we estimate by using the, the unit will be millimeter mercury because we want to add that up for many um, equations, but we, we might want to calculate the pressure and things like that. Anyway, so the bigger the IBC and the less collapse, the higher the 3P, the smaller and the more collapse um, denotes of a low central venous pressure. So, but in ad, inadequate LV preload, of course, it can cause by true hypovolemia, can be extra, cor extra corporeal loss, or it can be a third space loss. But sometimes it can be um, a mild distribution of blood volume, such as, you know, the blood cannot return to the heart in um, patient with high intrathoracic pressure, COPD, patient with positive pressure ventilation in respirator, tension in thorax where we renus return is diminished. Or you can have a high intrapericardial pressure in the patient with tamponade or venal dilatation in sepsis or anaphylaxis. All those will create a decrease of venous return. These two conditions, the true hypovolemia and the obstructive shock can be um, distinguish the two by looking at the IVC. In a true hypovolemia, you have a 
collapse IVC, whereas the obstructive shock, you had a lot of fluid try to come in into the heart, but it's you know, got a red light, it stops there. So you get accumulation, the IVC will be distended. So uh, obstructive shock can be um, either problem with filling or could be a problem with emptying. And these are the differential diagnosis of this. Although the small LV um, size can usually indicate hypovolemia, but a large LV does not mean that there is an adequate preload. When the ventricles are diseased, like you have a heart failure patient, you, you wouldn't expect the patient will have a collapse LV, kissing LV like that, even though the patient is hypovolemic. So, um, you know, on the one end, you have a small LV, you can be sure, or you can be, you know, it can be um, supportive of that, but a big LV doesn't mean that there is adequate filling pressure. You might need other measurements. And obviously these are the eyeballing techniques are only adequate in the extreme ends of cardiac filling, okay? So what are we gonna be do? Um, I might, uh, because I didn't give you a lecture before about the Doppler, but you know, I might, um, but some of you might have some the basics before. I tried to explain this, um, you know, in a, in a kind of a, um, you know, simple uh, as, as I can. During the athlete, the blood will come in um, from the left atrium into the left ventricle, called the LV inflow, the mitral inflow, um, in two phases. The first phase would be the ventricular early filling or ventricular relaxation. And the latter phase would be atrial contraction. So we got two phase, E for early filling and A for atrial contraction, okay? E and A. So E wave is usually um, produced by you know, the, the gradient between L left atrial uh, pressure and LV during early phase. So if the LA pressure is high, okay, you can have a very high A. Okay, but if your LV relaxation is impaired, you can have a low E, okay? And A will be produced by a phosphor atrial contractions there um, that would produce an A wave. So let's concentrate at the E, all right? E, e will um, change or associate with preload. If there is a high preload, high air pressure, the E would be high. Okay, if there is a less preload, the L um, or, or you know hypovolemia, E will be low. So if you look at the ratio E and A, if the E and A is less than one, okay, we can assume assume that there is a relative hypovolemia. But this is a very very too simplified. I, I could say that because there are other condition, other conditions that this can happen especially in patients with you know, de um, aging heart, where they had a you know, hypertensive heart, where they had a impaired relaxation, you, even though you don't have a low preload, but LV relaxation is impaired, you have a low E also. So it's a bit tricky, tricky, isn't it? But on the other hand, if E is more than A, it is pretty unlikely that you are, in, you are encounter situation of hypovolemia if E is greater than A. There's a lot of limitation as, as um, you know, as stated down below, um, too rapid or too slow heart rate, mitral valve disease, mitral regurg will cause a lot of, uh, cause the E wave to go higher. HO fib without A will be difficult to, <laughs> not difficult, but I mean, impossible to um, calculate E and A. Although the patients become um, sinus, but after atrial fibrillation, the atrial might paralyze for quite a period of time. So there is a, um, you know, uh, the A wave might be low. Um, so if you compare that to A, it might give you false impression. And uh, E wave, as I told you, it depends on the intrinsic diastolic function or the suction force, the relaxation of suction force. So, the, um, this might be a bit too detailed, but 
so now there's another parameter that we try to we can use for assessment of a feeling pressure by using a technique called tissue Doppler, because as as you uh, as I mentioned that e the the e wave in the velocity of the blood flow that's coming down uh, into the left ventricle during early uh, diastole depends on two factors. One is the LA pressure, two is the suction force of the heart. So why not, if we can, calc if we can measure the suction force of the heart and we divide E with that thing, all right? So you might get you know, the proportionate, you can, you can, you can get a, um, a factors that relate directly to the feeling pressure. So that's come E and E prime, okay? So if, if we measure the, um, the movement of the ventricles up and down during um, diastole become, you know, become relaxed, uh, moving away from the apex, that's called the E prime. So if we, we had that, we measured those two, you will get a um, LA feeling pressure or left atrial pressure. Okay, again, because E is a combination of um, LA pressure and a suction force. If you divide it by the suction force, you get LA feeling pressure. And this can be, con this has been confirmed by many studies that it related pretty well with the wedge pressure. So um, these are the roughly the guide if we can use the Dopplers. If we encounter a patient with um, hypotension, we can measure this E and A and E and E prime. If E is much, much higher than A and E over E prime is, mm, is, mm, is higher than 15, okay, you can assume that the LV filling pressure is high and there's no need to try to you know, challenge any fluid at all. On the opposite, if E over A is less than one and E over E prime is less than eight, the filling pressure is probably low. Hypovolemia is suggested. So you might want to um, you know, give fluid, um, fluid um, challenge in these patients. What if it's been to, between and you know all the, uh, the the two parameters does not agree, then you um, you're not sure what you encounter. <laughs> but the other thing is that instead of giving a real fluid into the patient who might not respond and you might encounter problem with fluid overload later, yeah, there are other ways that we might um, use an ultrasound to see whether patients will respond to fluid or not by measurement of cardiac output. I know this is a bit of a skip uh, because we, I haven't told you much about Dopplers, but anyway, if you had a patient with, you know, measurement their cardiac output, a stroke volume by where the head is high and the, you know, sitting up position, and you do the reverse tender Lindbergh, raise the legs up, it will be similar to those you are infuse about 500 uh, milliliters of saline in that patient. So you, you look at cardiac output, a stroke volume, how, how much does it change after you do, do the passive leg racing, okay? Um, the stroke volume, how do you measure it? It's, um, you have to measure the Doppler flow of the uh, velocity of the LV outflow track. This, you had to use the um, five chamber wheel and put the pulse Doppler in the LV outflow and record its velocity. This is the uh, graph of the spectral um, display of the velocity of pulse wave during systole. Okay, these are the, the wave that, <clears throat> if these are the velocity, if you integrate with the time, velocity time integration. So velocity and time integration would be distance, right? So the dist this distance is actually the, the distance of a, this um, cylinder, cylinder, cylinder. It's called the, um, so you can calculate the stroke volume. I know this is a bit skip of the, you know, there's a lot of assumption that, that I'm, I haven't explained it to you, but trust me that by, by measurement of this VTI or TVI, time velocity integration or velocity time integration, we look at this uh, factors and we, after we raise the 
um, passive rate lat latent test, we measure again. If this increase more than 15%, we, we can uh, predict that this patient probably will respond to fluid therapy. The other thing that is more popular is looking at the collapsibility of the IVC, where you see if it's in spontaneous respiration or in the positive ventilation, and you see the change um, during systole, sorry, during inspiration and the expiration, and you can calculate also with this index. There's many, many, um, you know, authors that's coming up. Um, it maybe varies a bit about where which one you you um is a dividend, which one is the um you know, uh, so it's a little bit different there, but, um, and each will perform differently. So they, you can use either static or you can use the dynamic parameters, but dynamic parameter is more, you know, more accurate. So it's more, more preferred. Okay, move on to condition of a cardiac tamponade, which is the one with not very easy to diagnose clinically. Okay, not very easy to diagnose cl clinically. Um, you have to use Bex triad, right? And, you know, Bex triad can be um, not very easy, I think, for most um, physicians. Hypotension, neck, engorged neck vein, and clear lung fields. You know, neck vein, I find a lot of my students struggle with it. <laughs> distant heart sounds, sorry. Distant heart sounds, uh, um, you know, is if you hear it, it's not that distant not it's not absent it's not so is this distance enough <laughs> how which um, you know how soft would the sounds be to um to call this a distant heart sound right hypertension can come from various various uh, etiology okay so other sounds come in to um and can be very useful for this the fluid appear black under the ultrasounds usually if it's not you know, um, not blood clot, um, a fresh blood, it usually appear black. However, present, uh, presence of percodial collection does not, does not equal tamponade. You can see that this patient had a collection of fluid in the posterior of the heart, but he actually is not suffering from, from a hemodynamic effects of it. We'll come to that later. But another thing that we have to keep in mind Although you can see an echo-free space, okay, um, suggests of a fluid, uh, you have to be able to distinguish pericardial effusion from that of a pleural effusion. Okay. Um, we will use the landmark of descending aorta. If the reflection of that um, echo-free space is beyond or, or posteriorly to that of descending aorta, that will be a pleural effusion, left pleural effusion. Whereas if the reflections come anteriorly to the descending aorta, that will be a per pericardial effusion. So don't mistake those two. Okay, this is a patients with both um, fluid, pericardial effusion and pleural effusion. Okay, but in this particular patient, the patient is suffering from tamponade. You can see that is there is a pressure effect on some of the chambers there. Okay, you see there's an echo free space anteriorly to the descending aorta, the, pro, uh, the pericardial effusion, posteriorly to the descending aorta, the pleural effusion. How much are there, the pericardial effusion? We can grade them as trivial. Trivial is considered normal, where you can see the pericardial separation only during systole. That's what consider normal. A small pericardial effusion is less than one centimeter. Okay, which you, when we measure, we measure during diastole, not during systole. The um, the this distance would be greater during that systole. So we measure during diastole. It was that's um, not more than one centimeter. Is a small pericardial effusion that will um, that will correspond to less than one hundred millimeter. Um, of fluid. A moderate would be about one to two centimeter. That will, associate, that will <clears throat> associate generally with 100 to 500 milliliter. A large effusion would be more than two centimeter. Or you can also see in front of the heart, 
in the back of the heart, so-called circumferential. That will equate to amounts of more than 500 millimeter. A massive prickly effusion that is circumferential, you can see the heart swinging, then usually there is a cardiac tamponade uh, occurring. Back stride, as I told you, the hypotension and gorgonic vein and distant heart sounds, these are not always easy. And although if you, if the three years are together, it's pretty specific, but um, um, it's not that sensitive at all. Some patient might not have all the, those three, three signs. You might need to do a special measurement of blood pressure to detect pulses paradoxes. That's another one that might help to detect tamponades. Another thing that I think we need to understand is that the amount of the fluid and the, um, and the pressure that it um, generates uh, are not uh, related linearly. It depends on a lot of other things. Um, doesn't mean that you always need a lot of fluid to create a lot of pressure. So the, the relationship between the pressure and, and volume can vary according to patients from patients to, to patients. The red lines is the precardial pressure. The more volume, of course, the pressure goes up. Okay. In this particular patient, you can see that um, um, the first, you know, the first 100 millimeter, you don't create much of a problem. But after more than 100 millimeter, the pressure goes up. Uh, that is exceed that of a right atrial pressure or the central venous pressure. But once the, the pericardial pressure exceeding that of a CVP or right atrial pressure, what happens? It will start to compress the right atrium and start to compress the IVC, SVC. So the, the blood with the venous return become diminished. So you will start getting problem with, you know, decreased cardiac output and mean arterial pressure. And if this, um, if the fluid gets more accumulated, the pressure goes up and it greater than the right blood pressure, which means the diastolic right blood pressure because, you know, um, the lower pressure will be affects first, the diastole, of course. So during diastole, the RV would be co collapsed or compressed during diastole. With that happen, there is, will be obvious um, you know, um, decrease of the cardiac output and uh, mean arterial pressures. But as I told you before that the relationships can vary from patient to patient, same amount, different pressure from patient to patient, patients. This depends on the, very much on the distendability dis of the pericardium. Some may have a very compliant um, pericardium. You can have a lot of fluid. With, especially with low rate accumulation, you can have a lot of fluid, you know, uh, very compliant pericardium, still low pressure. Whereas if you had a rapid accumulation of the fluid, especially during like cardiac rupture, hemo uh, pericardium, the pericardium has no time to adapt to that. The so pressures go up very quickly. Or you might have a very thick pericardium, fibrotic or, you know, inflamed pericardium. Then you have a non-compliant pericardium, you, the pressure goes up very quickly. So the factors that contributes to um, factors that contribute to cardiac tamponade are as follow. Pericardial pressures depends on the amount, rate accumulation, distendability of pericardium. On the other hand, the intracardiac pressure itself, if you had a hypovolemia, if the RA pressure is low, okay, RV pressure is low, RV pressure is low, then the heart would be easily compressed, right? Echo um, tamponade uh, signs are these four. You have pericardial collection, you had RA collapse. The RA pressure would be lowest during systole. You have the X descent, right? The X and Y descent. During X descent, uh, during systole, the RA pressure would be lowest, so it will collapse first during systole. Ventricular systole, that's, how, that's what I mean. And the RV, then RV will collapse during diastole. And almost always you have a dilated or distended IVC. Other signs that may be not easy, but will be more specific, and it will be 
more equivalent to process paradoxes. Are the interventional dependence where during inspiration you have a when the, the RV might get bigger, but you have a much smaller LV, there are interventricular dependence. Because the RV pressure is lower than the R, sorry, because the RA pressure is lower than the RV pressure. So you will get the signs of RE, RA collapse before getting the RV collapse finding. So it's a more, the RA collapse, RA systolic collapse is more sensitive RV diastolic collapse is more specific. So if you wait for the RV to collapse, then you be very specific. Uh, you, know, you, you won't get it wrong, but you might not diagnose everyone with tamponade. On the other hand, if you use RA collapse, you might you know, be more sensitive, but there are some patients may not you know, have real cardiac tamponade, especially if the, that RA collapse is actually not a real RA collapse, but uh, RA contraction. And you might misinterpret uh, that as RA collapse. So the RA collapse need to be more than one third of the cardiac cycle. So that um, will be, you know, uh, more specific signs. Look at these patients, A and B. They have more or less the same pericardial effusion, okay, of about, what's that, about maybe one, one, one point half centimeter or, or two centimeter. But one have tamponade and one has not. Which one? I think we can all say that um, B had a um, pressure effects on the RV. We can see that the free walls collapse during diastole. LA also collapsed. So that number B is having tamponades where the A have no tamponade. So same amount, different pressure. This patient had a large brick diffusion with collapse of right atrium during systole. So it's a early signs of competent tamponade. Um, but this patient had massive effusion in the heart swinging. RV is collapsed during diastole. This is even more obvious. And the precretive effusion in this patient is not black. So it's a bit more, you know, like turbid. It could be fluid. Um, that is, could be blood or, you know, a, a turbid fluid. You can see that the right ventricle side, RA and RV are so flat and collapsed. Same patient. This is parastinal long axis wheel. And sometimes you um, the um, you can't uh, the, the collapsing of the RV is very um, brief and you're not sure whether you know your eyes cannot pick up. You might want to use an M mode. M mode M stand for motion, where you um, make the plane where you want to cut through the RV and LV. And this you have a very good temporal resolution. I mean that you can look at the um, timing of cardiac cycle and you can see that the RV free walls, you know, collapse during early diastole there. So it's, you know, will we'll give you a, a more sensitive tool to detect tamponade. This is also an M mode of the same place cutting to RV and LV, um, but the sweeping speed is very slow. So you can see the change of the chamber size during respiration. Here you can see that in during inspiration, the RV enlarge, whereas you have a shift of the septum towards the left ventricle. So the LV become very small or collapsed during inspiration. So this is an interventricular dependence, septal shift. I think I move from this is a bit too complicated it's about Doppler effects. Okay, again, this is an mode showing RV collapse, okay, free wall collapse during diastole. I think this is too obvious. You don't need any M mode. You can see that the RV size is small, especially during diastole, where you have a um, collapse of the wall there. 
the LB contraction is very good there. And this particular patient in the um, precarious fusion is more like, uh, you know, as a, like a wiggling fi fibrins uh, or kind of could be clot of fibrins that wiggles in, in the cavities there. Usually this is not a transudative, but this yeah. must be exudative, very clear fusion. Yeah, but a lot of times we misdiagnose this because we're looking for echo-free space and we don't see one. But in this particular patient, you can see that the RARV is collapsed. And you might not see any fluid at all. But if you look carefully, there is fluid, but it does not appear black. It, it appears, you know, hyperechoic there. This is a clot or thrombus. It's a acute hemopericardium. So be aware of this because, uh, because if you don't look carefully, you'll misdiagnose, right? This patient had cardiac rupture with um, hemopericardium. So anyhow, if you encounter a patient with shock, there is more or less moderate amount of precarious effusion on the echo, and you have no other explanation of hypotension. Okay, you, you look and there is no other explanation. If the patient had, you know, moderate amount, I would say for safe, amount of precarious effusion, although you, you're not very familiar with the, you know, pressure effects or not, the intervular dependence, things like that. It's, too, it's not easy uh, sometimes. You will, you will uh, think that this patient, you must first think this patient uh, suffering from cardiac tamponade before, uh, you know, anything else, right? The other thing that might be helpful is IVC, okay? It's not specific at all. It can be dilated or distended on many, many um, conditions. But it's very sensitive, means that the absence of IVC plethora or dilated or distended IVC will virtually exclude it cardiac tamponade. Okay, because if you have a collapsed IVC, it's very, very, very unlikely that you're you, the patient is suffering from tamponade. Echo. Uh, or cardiac ultrasound can be used for treatment of um, cardiac tamponade by guiding pericardial synthesis. We will identify the shortest route. Doesn't mean um, used now today we um, seldom use subcyphoid um, approach. Usually an uh, intercostal apical approach, more, uh, more or less. Um, by draining the pericardial fusion, we need to be careful not draining too much. Um, usually, if it drains a bit, well, the pressure will comes down a lot. Uh, but um, you know, if still you can drain more, you might have to stop if you know more than a, one liter had had been drained, because there is a um, reported case of uh, acute right blood dilatation and, and dysfunction. And uh, I, I saw some of these patients, and they are quite. Scary <laughs> uh, if you want, if you've, you know, if, if this happened. Let's see. So, um, how do we do it? Okay. Um, this is a, um, um, a technique of um, once you enter the pericardial space and you're not sure whether this is a, um, this is a um, pericardial space or not, sometimes you're not sure, well, whether we tapped in the, the heart or not. Or is it a um, um, is it a pericardial space? We will um, use a technique called agitate saline. Okay, we use two two syringe and then create a bubbles. Okay, and inject that small you know bubbles into uh, into the space. If it the, the because other sounds cannot penetrate the sound, so we create that that white thing. You see that um, you know bright echo. And you, that's confirmed that the um, you know the catheter it's in the pericardium, okay. So you um, here if you tap in here, you're not sure whether it's in the pericardium or the pleural. Mind you that we don't use um, the um, the tip of 
um, needle in the ultrasounds as a guide where is the, um, you know, where's the tip is. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that I, I put this correctly. I mean, you, we don't use the um, apparent tip in the picture to um, confirm the site of the true tip of the needle. Why is that? Because the ultrasound plane, you know, it's, it's a plane, but the needle can go beyond that plane. So you can only see where the, um, the needle is in that plane, but not the true, not the true, you know, not the true um, uh, tips of the needle. So you, that is something you have to be careful. Um, this patient had both pericardial effusion and pleural effusion. So we need, if we inject the actually ceilings in and it appears in um, which space, all right? If it's in this space here, over here, so it means that you are not entering the pericardium, you're draining the pleural effusion. But in this particular patient on the right, you can see that this, um, you know, the bubbles goes into the um, um, pericardial space. So it's the right space that you want. So after drainage, you can see that, be, sorry, before drainage, you can see this is the pulse ox oximetry, but you can see that the pulse oximetry can also um, use as a, you know, non-invasive arterial lines, if you like. You can see the varying of the, uh, the um, pulse pressure, okay, the, the, the strong, the volume of the pulse there. During inspiration, you have a smaller pulse, because um, during, um, during inspiration, the pulse pressure becomes lower, or the, the, the pulse volume is smaller. This is a process paradox, right? So after drainage, you have a more or less you know, equal, or the same amount of the volume. So you get rid of tempered uh, physiology there. And this is one patient that um, I got referred to. Um, some of the doctors, um, you know, he's too keen on that. He saw that he saw the tamponade. He wants to do a pericardiosynthesis, but without much, you know, experience. And he entered the heart. You can see the catheters go right into the heart, <laughs> actually into the aorta, and that's obviously it create a, um, a very, <laughs> very uh, stressful um, day for everyone. So be careful, okay? Don't be overconfident. If you don't, you're not skillful enough, not, it's not experienced enough, refer the patient, that you identify, you diagnose and send the patients to most more experienced patients, uh, 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 doctors. Okay, now we go to another condition in hemodynamic unstable patients that present with acute RV shock syndrome or acute RV failure syndrome. Start with the case of 45 years old woman who present with acute dyspnea and shock. This is her ECGs. ECGs had a sinus tachycardia, right axis deviation, right bundle branch block. It had a Q wave in, in, in the lead three and inverted T in the lead three, the S1, right? S1, Q1, oh, sorry, S1, Q3, three, um, T3, right? Sort of pattern. Anyways, you had a right ventricular strain, ECGs. This is the um, echo image of the patient. The patient's in shock, but you look at the left ventricle is contracting pretty well. Not um, rigorously, but it's contracting well, good enough. There is no um, precarial effusion to, to mention much about. There's you know, some trivial um, separation during systole. So it's not tamponade, it's not a pumping failure. But you can look, you can see, you can, um, you can um, appreciate that the RV there is much bigger than the usual patients that we've seen before. On a short axis wheel, instead of having a donut and a croissant, your donut is not shaped like an O anymore. It's more like a D letter, right? D letter where the septum become flattened. The septum become flattened. So this means that the pressure on the right side is more than the left side. The RV enlarged with pressure effects and it creates a bulging or paradoxical movement of the septum, flattening of the septum. The, the left ventricle become eccentric shape. And this 
eccentricity index, where you had the um, long diameter divided by um, short diameter. Usually it's one, right? It's, there's no long or short if it's a circle, but if you know, it's not a circle, the long over the short, the bigger, it will be 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. This is called in, uh, eccentricity, difficult words to pronounce, eccentricity index. If this, um, this will, um, this have a prognostic um, implication if it's very eccentric. This is a short axis of a great arteries. We, we cut above the aortic valve, you can identify the pul pulmonary arteries. We usually call this a uh, trousers where you had pulmonic valve there and MPA there and left pulmonary arteries there and right pulmonary arteries there. But in this particular patient, the, uh, the trousers, the right legs <laughs> are, are, short, <laughs> are short because there are filling defects there, something filled something filled in, occupied in a right pulmonary artery. It's more like a, a, a jelly, gelatinous mass. It's a thrombus that obstructing the right pulmonary artery. Right pulmonary arteries, sorry, the main pulmonary artery more or less is dilated there too. The full chamber view, where you should, um, you should um, see that the RV normally would be less than two third, but over here is, bigger than the left ventricle already. Although the RV contracting well, but the RV is not, okay? RV is not contracting well at all. Maybe a little bit preserved at the apex, but you know, the body itself, the base part, basal part is not contracting well. The RA is large also. So you had a big RV, non-contractile RV, okay? The relatively preserved function at the apex is called MAC, Connell sign, okay? If you have a dilated non-contractile RV with preserved apical function, uh, a part of the RV is called a MAC Connell sign. Is this useful? Oh, it's useful in that it may be, it may be, it might help you to dis distinguish this to um, a chronic condition, like in um, core pulmonal, pulmonary hypertension that you know, happens for a long time, they wouldn't have the signs. But this McConnell signs may be not very useful in an acute setting where you might need to distinguish this particular picture from two conditions, massive pulmonary embolism and acute right midline infarction. In right midline infarction, you still, you have big RV, non-contract type, big RV, dilated RV, but you also can have McConnell sign too, because the apex of the RV is supplied by the LAD, whereas the body of the RV is supplied by RCA, right coronary artery, right coronary arteries. So you have to obstruct your RCA, the apex will still contracting well. So as McConnell sign will not help to distinguish massive pulmonary embolism to that of a right ventricular infarction. Okay, the, the patient had tricuspid regurgitation. and we measured the velocity of it. We can calculate by Bowling equations, we can get gradient across it. And this patient had a, a high gradient of 48 across the tricuspid uh, valve. With that, we can calculate the RV systolic pressure and PA pressure. However, with acute pulmonary embolism, although the afterload increased a lot, you should have increased in pulmonary pressure or RV pressure, but it will not increase a lot. There's a rule called the 60-60 rule because the RV is impaired. So it cannot generate much of the pressure. So it, it will be eleva elevated, but it would not exceed 60 millimeter mercury. The TR gradient would not be more than 60. 60-60 sign. The other, the other 60 is the pulmonary acceleration time, which would mean the, um, the afterload is increased rapidly the RV is not adapting well. These are the echo findings and acute pulmonary embolism. I think you can find these in um, pulmonary hypertension guidelines, things like that. But you have to be careful that half of the patient with acute pulmonary embolism will have a normal echo. And this is especially true if it's not, you know, if, if, if it's not massive pulmonary 
massive Fourier embolism, right? Submassive Fourier embolism cannot be excluded with echo, with ultrasound. However, if the patient is suspecting um, of having pulmonary embolism and having a hemodynamic unstable with a shock, and you don't find any findings of dilated non-contactile RV, then you can exclude pulmonary embolism as a cause because with pulmonary, um, with hemodynamic unstable, you should be, there must be a signs of a dilated and non-contactile right ventricle. And this is another patient with, you know, D-shaped LV. Ah, this patient, you can see that the RV dilated. The apex had not mac corneal signs there, contracting there. But you, you can also see a tubular structure moving, wiggling in the right atrium. Okay. You might want, you might con uh, wondering what this would be. This, this look like a kind of parasite, a kind of worm, <laughs> and round worm of some kinds in the, in the blood. Now this is actually a column of blood clot that comes from the deep vein thrombosis that migrates to the heart, transit, okay, the heart, okay. Some of them already went to the pulmonary arteries and some of them are still, you know, wiggling, um, hanging around in the right atriums. Also, you have to note that the LV is very small. There is a kissing walls of LV. LA also very small. So if you cover your hand with it on, on the right side, looking on the left side, you might see, you may notice that it's very, very similar to that of a hypovolemia, right? Because it's underfilled LV. But this is not a case of hypovolemia because the RV is not collapsed or not small at all, only the left side. Because if you have a complete obstruction of the pulmonary artery, very little blood go into the left side, right? There's obstruction of the circuit there. Okay, this is RV inflow view. Okay, and the, this is RV inflow outflow view, which I didn't, didn't um, t um, you know, mention before. But just want to, you to show you this moving and con contractile, um, the, the, um, the, the blood um, thrombus transit. You, at the uh, pulmonary artery levels, you can see that the um, both side of the trousers <laughs> are obstructed by the RP, LPA and RPA. There's a filling. There's a mass that obstructs there. So those are blood clot there, corresponding to the um, CT there. So this, this patient, we gave a um, fibrinolysis. And after six hours, you can see that the right pulmonary arteries are cleared, but the left pulmonary artery is still obstruct. So we continue that. And then we have a complete resolution of the PA thrombus. Okay. So the patients become much, much better. Okay, the blood pressure goes up, ox oxygen goes up, heart rate comes down, and the LV you see after fibrolysis, you can see the LV become much more, there's much more filling there, right? The, it's more, it's more dilated, more, you know, more volume there on the left side. This is the uh, M mode of the left ventricle. We had intervular dependence, similar to that in tamponade. Patient with, patient with acute massive pluriembolism do have intervular dependence also. Uh, after fibrolysis, that disappeared. So once again, echo finding in pluriembolism, the RV is enlarged and poorly contracts. So you, you have a pulmonary artery dilatation. You get a tricuspid regurge with a high gradient, but not exceeding 60 millimeters mercury. You have a dilated IVC with reduced respiratory variation. You have evidence of poor hypertension. One pitfalls that some of the newer, you know, um, um, performers would um, encounter is that the plane of four chamber view that they cut may not be the right one. 
you look at the lower part, if you, you see that the, uh, if your plane of cutting the full chamber view, the right, the correct plane is that you need to cut the RV at the, the major axis. If you rotate it a bit and cutting, you know, not, you know, not along the, the, um, the major axis of the RV, you will underestimate the size of RV. So even the RV is already dilated, you will say, oh, it's still normal, right? So you, you um, misdiagnose um, RV shock syndrome. That might happen. So be careful in, uh, you know, cutting all the planes. If you cut the short axis obliquely, even the airway is still round, you will create a oval or eccentric left ventricle by creating, you know, a false you know, image, you know, oblique cut. So these are what I call echocardiographic disease, which we need to avoid at all costs. Okay, once again, the lower part would be a normal echo. The other one would be the one with poor hypertension. The little RV flattened LV, D shape. Okay, RV is bigger than LV. Okay, this is another patient with um, same thing. Okay, oh, sorry, we, we already look at this one. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Ah. Okay, so um, the I told you that the if you see the the dilated RV non-contractile RV, there is two conditions you need to distinguish: the RV infarction and the RV um, and the massive pluriembolism, and uh, the two need to be distinguished by looking. Of course, the clinical may be different; ECG might be different, but sometimes they can masquerade in each each other. Echo uh, of short axis might help a bit. Although you ha both have a dilated or non-contractile RV, D-shaped LV flattening of the septum. But if you look carefully, the inferior wall, th this is called the inferior wall, okay? If you look at the, this as a clock, from six o'clock, from five or six o'clock to about 3 p.m., right? These are the posterior and inferior wall. You can see that during systole, they don't contract at all. There aren't any um, systolic thickening. They might move a bit, but there's no th real thickening. Whereas in A, there is normal contraction there. So in this, in the B, you would suspect that the inferior and posterior wall is, there is a microdo infarction, okay? There's a regional wall motion abnormality there, which denotes the um, posterior inferior wall, uh, inferior posterior wall MI, that will, give you the clue that this RV is an RV infarct, not an acute massive polyembolism. okay? Right, okay, uh, this is another patient, interesting one. Very young man, present with syncope, acute dyspnea, very, very low oxygen saturation, 40. The patient is in shock. You see the RV is dilated, non-contractile. RV is compressed. It has a D-shape, D-shape left ventricle. Again, you see something wiggling in the right atrium. RV is dilated, poorly contracts. P MPA, you can identify blood clot again. So is it a straightforward um, massive program policy again? Oh, they're not quite straightforward. There's something wiggling there. So you know, maybe a clot transit from the deep vein thrombosis, right? But if you look carefully, the clot is, looks like it's coming from the interatrial septums, isn't it? Not from the IVC, it's come from the interatrial septums, okay? And if we do a track esophageal image, we, we identified massive clot, okay? In um, abundant of clot in the almost obliterate the pulmonary artery, both left and right side. The, uh, the clot that's in the right atrium, we identify that it's not only attached to the interatrial septums, it's actually extended into the left atrium. So it's only uh, both on the right side and the left side. What happened? The three dimensional image shows that it's actually like it's, you know, penetrating the interatrial septum, isn't it? 
Is this kind of uh, parasite that bites through the interceptant? Well, no. Because during the pulmonary embolism, the pressure on the right side goes up. What happens is that the prominent overlay, okay, opens up. The patent from an overlay, PFO, creates that, that you will create that, okay? And this things might, this PFO from an overlay closed when you, when you were born. It was useful from chanting oxygenated blood from the umbilical vein from your uh, mother placenta to, to the left side. But once you, once you are you know, delivered um, out of your mother, normal circulation happens and then pressures on the right sides go down. This um, overlay, um, you know, this foramen closed. Okay. Okay. So this is the um, the blood clots that goes through the foramen overlays that opens when the right atrial pressure goes up. Okay. This is a stratting from the true PFO. Okay. That's it. That's what's happened. Okay. Um, this is another case with uh, blunt chest trauma. Um, a young man, a, a middle-aged man who uh, sustained a car accident, okay, and uh, there was a tamponade and, you know, the patient was drained of the fluid and become better, but however, on the seventh day, they become, he still had dyspnea and hypoxia, neck vein is engorged, okay. The monitor, look in the monitor, you can see that the CVP had a strange looking kind of graph, it shows like a giant V wave that, up there, so this is a patient with a severe tricuspid regurgitation. You can see in this patient, the RV is enlarged again, but it's different. This time, this time the RV is contracting very well, okay? The PA, the pulmonary artery is not enlarged. It's the same, it's normal size. The RV, although you had a D shape of the RV, but the RV is contracting well. This is not a case of pulmonary embolism, right? Uh, this is a case of acute tricuspid regurgitation where you had a tricuspid valve that flail because of a blunt chest trauma. It's, it's a traumatic tricuspid regurgitation. So it's not always that a big RV means that you had a prohypertension uh, or polyembolism. A tricuspid regurgitation, especially in an acute setting like this, um, can um, um, mimics a bit of those. Okay. Okay, lastly, now we come to the conclusion, perhaps the, the, the final parts of it is using the um, part of care ultrasounds during and after resuscitation. I think the, the most important thing is to identify 5H and 5T differential diagnosis, especially when you had a PEA, where you have the electrical that is pretty much normal, but somehow you don't have any cardiac output. There are two things. It could be a true PEA, which means the electromechanical dissociation or the pseudo PAA where, you know, there is the, the, the electrical is fine, muscle is actually fine, but somehow there's no venous return to the heart. And um, we might use the ultrasound for guiding um, life-saving procedures. The true PA, the electromechanical dissociations happens when you have a prolonged arrest or massive myocardial disease like MRI, myocarditis, things like that. Pseudo PA is obstructive shock. We have a de decrease of venous return. Doing an, an ultrasound, um, um, doing um, resuscitation, you might interfere with the chest compression, but you must keep in mind that this is serious. You might, you should not interfere with chest compression, uh, even though there might, um, the, the study says that there might be pauses by more than six, six seconds, but try not to use a subside for a view. That will be uh, the best, best um, um, view uh, to use. A total absence of cardiac activities um, means that the patients had extremely poor prognosis, but that doesn't mean equal to the um, cessation of resuscitation effort. It's one of the factors, but not uh, ultimate factors that the resuscitation effort should be stopped. So in summary, in patient with hemodynamic unstable or patient with cardiac arrest, and then we resuscitate up, we use ultrasounds to um, cardiac ultrasounds to distinguish these four conditions. The first one, if you see a massive uh, sorry, pericardial effusion or even anything more than moderate, okay, you can see if there is a compressed right side of the heart, a dilated IVC, 
it's a tempered heart, right? If you had an enlarged RV, poorly contractile, a kinetic RV, it's a massive polyembolism or RV infarction. If you have a dilated ventricle, poorly contract um, ventricles could be regionally, regional or globally, then this is a pumping failure, right? Like in MI, myocarditis, things like that. If the LV is look small and vigorous contracts, RV is small, IVC is collapsed, hypodynamic heart, this suggests of a hypovolemia. This could be like those of sepsis can be have a similar kind of finding too. So these fi four findings is very useful. The other, of course, would be you know, non cardiac ultrasounds like the um, 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 you know, looking at the lungs, like uh, looking at the lung sliding, lack of lung sliding in pneumothorax. So that's in summaries of uh, that's all that I want to um, um, give you some um, introduction to how to use ultrasounds in emergency situation. But of course, the eye who sees only what they look for. You need to be um, familiar with all those pathology. So once you there is in front of you, you it, it has some meaning to you. And last word I like to say is that POCUS is a part of physical examination. It will not replace a good clinical um, judgment, good clinical uh, you know skill. So um, keep that, and also you know add this um, to your skill, and you will make a, a better doctor, be able to help more patients. So thank you very much for um, your attention, and hopefully um, um, you will and join us at the workshop and you will improve your skill further. Thank you.